Hope you guys enjoyed it last week. I really did. Uh, I enjoyed uh, reading the chapter and the study of it and, uh, um, and all of that. Uh, so let me uh, open us in a word of prayer real quick and we'll get uh, started with the presentation. Uh, Father God, Lord, I thank you again for uh, these guys and their hearts to, uh, to show up on a Saturday morning and, and open your word and uh, uh and study what it what it means and who you are, Lord. I just pray that you would uh, open our hearts and minds. Uh, some are probably so a little foggy this morning, and uh, Lord, I pray that uh, that you would speak clearly to John as he presents us. I pray all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Josh. I just want to check Ring Central. I know we had one person on. Let's see if anyone else joined. We just have the one person. Okay, good morning, men. It's uh, good to be with you all. Thanks for coming out on a freezing cold Saturday morning. It's, uh, it's good to see all of you, good to see all everybody here. A uh, couple of things, uh, just housekeeping before we start. Someone asked about if we have questions, how are we going to handle that? And uh, here's what we're going to do with a group this size, and because we really only have about 45 minutes of time, 50 minutes of actually teaching together. What we, uh, when we did this class years ago, there was a lot more discussion and a lot more back and forth because we had groups of five, six, and seven men sitting around a big table. It's a little bit easier to do that. In a format like this, it's just not going to be possible just because of the time factor. We'll have some, some time of discussion at the tables, but if you have a question, you can post it to the email if it's a question for the whole group. Certainly send an email to Josh or myself. We'd be happy to talk. Or, as Josh is going to talk about at the end of the class today, we're going to leave the tables up when class ends. Uh, we made more coffee this time. I think there's six gallons instead of 1.5 or C. I don't know how many, but we, there's a lot of coffee over there. So we'll, uh, we'll sit and chat afterwards. We know that some of you need to leave right at 8 uh, or shortly after. That's fine. But uh, we'll leave the tables down this time so that uh, we can sit and talk. And if anyone has any questions, we can, uh, we can certainly address them there. Um, and then the Ring Central link. Uh, we know that, uh, that that's out there for all of us, for you to use. If there is a, for whatever reason, you can't make it, uh, or it's just cold, it's just for whatever reason, snow, or just can't come. We got someone who's quarantining for COVID this morning and uh, asked for it, but that'll always be posted. You're welcome to join with that as well. So here's what I want to start with, because uh, I see some new faces out here. This is good. At your tables, let's go around again. Let's spend some time, just introduce yourself, and then... Share one thing to take away from chapter two. And you can be honest and say, I didn't read it this week, so I'm looking forward to hear your takeaway from chapter two. That is okay. As I said before, if you do not read the chapter, please don't let that keep you from coming. We want you to come in. We, anyways, we know everyone is busy. Some of the chapters will get long. This week's was a short one. Next week gets a little bit longer. Uh, but don't let that keep you from coming or participating. So again, why don't you share, uh, introduce yourself, and then share a takeaway from chapter two. Go ahead, guys. Hey, if you're sitting at a, at a table with just two or whatever, uh, try and join another table with two. Um, consolidate tables a little bit, and uh, um, that way there's a little bit better discussion. Hey guys. Oh, I didn't know I had my screen minimized. Okay, we got a couple more guys on here. Good morning, everyone. Can you guys, you guys can hear me okay? Okay, I'm working on the tech so that you can see my presentation. Uh, we had brought another computer to do this separately. It just didn't work out. So I apologize. Uh, we won't be able to follow along with the presentation this morning. I'll try to stay here so at least within the range of the camera. All right, glad you guys joined us at right home. <laughs> Good morning, Peter. Glad you made it, Peter. <laughs> John, I'm sure whatever you had to share was funny. I'm sorry I missed it. All right, so here's what happens. I'm going to uh, go back to my presentation, which means I'll lose you on my screen. 
Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the problem is I'm limited just a minute. Does that help? I'm limited by a very short cord, unfortunately, here. Can you see it now? All right, let me try. Let me go stand on the other side then. Can you see the TV? Okay, I'm going to leave it right there then. Good morning. Welcome. All right, guys, about 30 more seconds. Okay, so just like last week, let's uh, just let's just share out from the tables. Uh, you can't share what your idea was. Share what somebody else said. So just how about a few? Take away from chapter two. Something meaningful. He said good donuts. good donuts from last week. That's good. Don't be shy, guys. I'm okay with awkward silence. <laughs> Christ is the Word of God. Good. We're going to talk about that because I think that's a good question. You ever think, why did, why, do, why did John refer to Jesus as the Word? It's a kind of an interesting phrase to describe Christ or to, to name Christ. We're going to talk about that at the end of the presentation. Does God, um, does God still put words in people's mouth? Does God still put words in people's mouth? That's actually a whole chapter dedicated to that coming up. Uh, you hear me say that a lot. We'll get to that in the future, right? It's just, that's coming. Yep. Circle back? We will. We're going to circle back. Sometime in the next three years, we will. How about one more? These are good. One more. Among the members of the Trinity is especially God the Son, who is, who in his person as well as in his words, has the role of communicating the character of God to us and expressing the will of God to us for us. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Okay, again, a couple of just things by way of review because I think this is really important. The purpose of this class is we've got to move beyond just the intellectual pursuit, and that's what I really appreciate about Grudem because he stresses that more than any other theologian or writer I've, that, I've, that I've read. He stresses that, and that is really, really important to us, as, uh, especially those who have been to a seminary or a Bible college. It's, uh, it's easy to let the scriptures and the study of God become just an intellectual pursuit. You're writing papers and you're studying Greek and languages and doing these things. But yet what I love about Grudem is he says it's more than that. It's much more than that. Because uh, it's, the Bible is not a, just a textbook. It is the very words of God. So what does, this, what does this do for us? My hope, Josh and I both hope for all of us, for everyone here that joins us in this, is that... What we do on Saturday mornings would drive us to study the scriptures, to know more about our God, so that we can worship Him more fully, and that our hearts and minds and lives would be transformed, because that is what the power of the scriptures does when we study it. It's when we study the Word of God, it's what it does. Again, class norms, we promise we will start on time and we will end on time, because I know that's important. So we will start right at, Shev start right at 7 a.m. sharp, and uh, we'll be done at 8 o'clock and again, it was, a, it was purposeful doing this on Saturday morning just because we know everyone has busy lives. We want to be respectful of that. Also, there will be disagreements as we go through this book. Some of the topics that we study have been debated and argued in the church for the last 2,000 years. And so there will be points of disagreement. And we remember that Wayne Grudem is a, is a man who wrote these words. Uh, and God gave him the gift of teaching, gave him an intellect to be able to write these things down to summarize for us and to put the scriptures together in a way that helps us to understand better. But he is just a man. You will disagree with the writer of the book sometimes. Uh, you'll disagree with one another, but let's not let those things divide us. Maybe we be respectful in our disagreement uh, because we, as, as followers of Christ, we've got to respond in love. We have to. As I said last week, that is sorely missing in the church right now. Uh, we've allowed a lot of things on the outside to come and divide us as followers of Christ. 
other resources. The podcasts are there. Uh, I know John, uh, Josh is going to share both the presentations with these links if you haven't found them yet. Uh, there are podcasts. There's literally, I think, over 100 hours of Wayne Grudem walking through with the Sunday school class in his church in Arizona. You're well, I, I, I listen to these in the car over a series of months. I would just, as I drove to work and back, I would play them. And it's really interesting listening to him talk, take questions from the audience. And uh, you're, that's, uh, the links are there. Uh, you can find those at WayneGrudem.com, his website. Also, we use, we'll be using other resources, too, such as our church constitution has our own doctrinal statement. If you haven't read that yet, I would challenge you to do so. Uh, it's really uh, it's interesting to read churches' doctrinal statements. You can go to any church. They're, they're all posted online. But if you're an attender or a member of Village Bible Church, I would take a look at it and just look down through our, our doctrinal statement. And then also we have, there's VBC distinctives that uh, we've written as a church to respond to issues that come up. Uh, you can, uh, those are all posted on our website, and you're welcome to look at that as well. These are just some of the resources we will be using as well in this class. So here we are in chapter 2. Uh, this morning is, uh, we're looking at the Word of God. Uh, this is our all, these are all the, the chapters in part 1, the doctrine of the Word of God. Next week, we're going to get into the canon, which is a, a heavier topic. Uh, the canon is uh, all of the books of the Bible. How did they came to be? And then how can we know, can we know, that these are the very words of God. If they were transmitted by copying by human beings over thousands of years, do we really have the word of God that we hold in our hands now? Can we, can we trust in that? That is a great question. And uh, those who, uh, who are against us as Christians would, uh, would hold that fact very tightly that you've got, you've, got a group, you've got a bunch of stories in your hand over the thousands of years. It's not the word of God. It's not inspired. So these are, this, uh, these are the chapters that will carry us through uh, March 20th and the complete uh, part one, the doctrine of the Word of God. So this morning, let's get into uh, the chapter this morning. One of the difficulties I have is taking, first of all, taking the study that Wayne Grudem's done and then being able to present it in, uh, in about 40 minutes. Uh, the, last week, this week was a little easier to do that. Next week, when you're talking about the canon of the Scripture in about 45 minutes, that's a real challenge. Uh, but uh, this morning, I want to talk about the Word of God. How does God speak to us? How has He spoken to us in the past? So these are the five sections we're going to look at within this chapter. Uh, the five are that we're going to look at the actual words of God, the very words that God speaks. Scriptures share that with us, that God has spoke through, uh, to us through the prophets, through, the, through human beings. He's placed His words in their mouths. Uh, he's, God speaks to us through creation. Through nature, he speaks to us through our moral compass, meaning that sense of right and wrong that human beings have, and last, through the written word, the scriptures, and we're really going to jump into that one next week when we talk about the canon of the scriptures. So let's look at the first one. How does God speak to us? If we look back at Genesis 1, if you can back, if you have your Bibles with you, open it up to uh, Genesis 1 and take a look at the statements God makes in creation. So if you have your Bible, electronic device, Go ahead and open to Genesis 1, and just take a look at the, and God says, for just a minute. While you're doing that, what I love about this is the statements in a few of those, and God said statements, where God said, for example, in Genesis 1, 3, God said, let there be light, and then there was light. And I love the fact that it says, uh, you look at these verses, and God said, and then it, and it was so. He said it, and it was so. And if you look at what was so, he, the very words he spoke with creation, there was no question, it was. He spoke all of that we know, unimaginable complexity into existence. That is an amazing thing when we think about it. So we have examples of God's actual words. Look down that, the chapter there, the first uh, 20 verses of Genesis 1, and you can see all that God said, and then you can see where they, and it was so. I just love that phrase that's inserted there. Other words of God, we look at creation with Adam and Eve. Is that, do you ever think that God spoke to Adam and Eve with his words? They listened to God and had a relationship with him as someone speaks to a friend. We're going to get into that in a minute. That's how God decided to speak to Moses. But what an amazing thing. Genesis 1, 28 through 30. We won't read all of that. Look at the bottom of your chapter. And God said to Adam and Eve, He's told them with his words, he spoke to them, be fruitful and multiply. And he goes on to say, subdue the earth and all that is in it, and goes on to share the rest of that with Adam and Eve. He spoke actual words to 
Adam and Eve. And then this is after the fall. And I'm going to go ahead and read this. Genesis 3, 8, and 9 with Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And what this shows me or makes me think about is that they were accustomed to God speaking to them with his voice. They had that type of relationship with Almighty God in the perfection of God's creation in the Garden of Eden. What an amazing thing. They were accustomed to this God speaking to them, and they had that relationship. But then the fall changed everything, and that relationship changed, and the curse of sin changed everything in the world. We have uh, God's actual words regarding his son. If we go to Matthew chapter 3, this is that uh, John the Baptist is baptizing Jesus, and then it says, The voice from heaven said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. That was heard by the people that were there witnessing this. We have God's actual words again. And then we have God speaks through people. As I mentioned Moses earlier, if you look at Exodus 4.15, Uh, You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you both what to do. Remember, this was Moses who said, I I, I can't speak, I'm nervous, I'm not doing this. He went through, he saw God speak to him through the burning bush, and then he still, I'm not doing this. And God, seems to me, he got a little bit angry and said, I'll send your brother. But he said, I will be with your mouth and with your brother's mouth, and I will teach you what to do. I will put those words in your mouth. And then there's Exodus 33, 11. I love this verse too. Is the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face. Now think about this. As a man speaks to his friend. Wow. They would speak face to face as a man speaks to his friend. God speaks to us through people. We look at Jeremiah. We look at Jeremiah 1, 9. The Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, Jeremiah says. The Lord said, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. We see that in the prophets. All, it's uh, repeatedly in the Old Testament is that God says, I will put my words in your mouth. We see it again in the prophet Isaiah. This is Isaiah chapter 6, that beautiful picture of the throne room of God. And Isaiah says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Isaiah said, Here I am, send me. And he said, God said to him, Go, say this. God's putting his words into the mouth of his prophet Isaiah to speak to his people. So here's the question, and John, you brought this up a little bit earlier. I want you to think about this for a second. Does this continue today? Does God continue to speak in that same manner as he did with the prophets? So what is the difference then between the words of the Old Testament prophet and the words of a pastor like Tim Bedall today? Does God speak? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit? Tell me a little more. Well, the Holy Spirit enters uh, those who call Jesus Lord, and um, and and just just as God spoke through the prophets, He speaks. The Holy Spirit, God, Jesus gives us His Spirit to be able to uh, communicate with each and every one of us who calls yeah. Him Lord and Savior. Yeah. Good. Good. John, I was actually, I get that the Holy Spirit, but what about when you got these people that say, you know, <clears throat> and the Lord spoke to me, the people that are trying to prophesying things that you, you, know, you might see a YouTube video of someone. Uh, yeah. I, that's kind of, kind of, yeah, I get that part. Of it. I, I, I would be worried about that as yeah. far as yeah. the individual, but I mean, only God knows somebody's heart. Yeah. So. so, but you guys bring up a good point because I'm going to skip to the second line of this slide. I was with a group when I was uh, in Central America. Uh, I was down there uh, studying Spanish and then just seeing what life was like, see what people do is when they're missionaries, and I wanted to know what that was all about. So I ended up doing some work with a church from California that was a Pentecostal church, charismatic church. We'll get get into more of that later. And I remember we were in a prayer time afterwards, and it was freaking. People would stand up, and then they would put their hand out and say to someone who was either had had a question or just someone wrestling with a decision, they'd put their hand up and say, I have received a word from the Lord for you. We've got to think about the gravity of that statement. Is that the same? When that, is that was what that person saying? Does that go back to this, where Isaiah had the vision of being in the throne room of God and God saying, go and save this? Does that carry the same weight? To say, for one of, for if I stood before you and said, I have a word of the Lord directly from God, I'm now going to share that with you. 
we have to think about that a little bit because we think we have to and so we have to question that a little bit as well because there's a there 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 is a difference there is a difference between what i'm doing now is i am explaining and teaching the word of the lord that's what ten, that's what any pastor does when they stand up correct they're explaining to us they are not saying i have a new revelation that god has directly given to me they are opening the words that god gave to a, a writer or a prophet of the Old and New Testament, and they are expounding, they are teaching that. They are explaining that. That's expositional preaching. That's what a preacher and a teacher of the Bible does. That is very different than saying, I have a new revelation. I have a new words of God that are not written here. Because if that is true, then if God is actually speaking through some of the way they did through the prophets, that is the word of God. God is using a human being to speak through them. Therefore, it carries the same weight than it must as Scripture because that is God speaking. So I think we have to be, just be careful of that. So we can say, we pray with people all the time in our small groups, right? And people ask us, we've asked for advice. We go to people and say, I'm struggling with this. And we go to people and say, what do you think? Is this a wise decision? People say, people give me advice, right? I've done that. Now, I don't think what they're saying when they give me advice is God has spoken directly to me and says you should do this. What they're saying is I get a sense in my heart, the wisdom that God's given me, that maybe you should consider this. That is not saying, that's saying I'm using the wisdom of Scripture that the Holy Spirit's put upon them to guide me, but I don't think that they're saying is that God has directly spoken to me with all authority just as it did with the prophets of old. So there's the difference. Any questions about that? Does that make sense? It's not a question, yeah. but an, an, maybe an ad, and that's that is in the, the the fruits of the not the fruits of the spirit, but like in gifting. Like somebody has maybe been given the gift of discernment, and so they're helping you to clarify how God spoke through His Word already as, as a yeah. add-on. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, excellent. That God gives God gives spiritual the Holy Spirit and power. Each one of us have it if we're a follower of Christ, if we're saved. Like the Holy Spirit indwells us, and God gives every single one of us then a spiritual gift that we are to use to glorify God and serve the church and serve others. We all have that. You're absolutely right. Thanks for bringing that up. You're absolutely right. Is that is different from using that spiritual gift than saying, I have, that God has spoken to me as he did to the prophets and the writers of the scriptures of old. That is a big difference. So there's someone else had a hand back here and then Al. Anyone else? They see another hand? Al? Yeah, um, I know in Hebrews it says God spoke through the prophets in the past, but to the, now He's spoken through His Word. Right. Um, right. I, so I, you know, I fully believe that. But I have heard once in a while on um, Moody, where, for example, a person who came to faith that was a Muslim, and they said they had kind of a vision, and they saw Jesus say, "Come to me." And I wondered, would, would could that really happen today, where it was? actually Jesus speaking, and, and they are a believer today in Christ. It's not a focus focus thing or something like that. I, I just, it makes me wonder. Al's wondering if, uh, if that anybody that? hear that question that we heard that? Okay. <laughs> I think, you know, what my personal opinion on that, I know that Grudem does address that. We're going to get to that too, Al, in more greater detail. I would be hesitant to tell someone that what they experienced and if they were saved that that was not real, but that's uh, we, we'll talk more about yeah. that. That would be hesitant to say that God, who knew how to, that God did not come down, or Christ did not say this to them. I, but I think it's different too when we say that I have a word for you, that this carries the weight of Almighty God and elevates them, because that would have to be elevated to the level of the scriptures, yes? Because that's God's word. He's revealing something new to us. And I want to make sure that we make the difference between using discernment and gifts of teaching and explaining and, and expounding and discussing the Word of God versus a new revelation of the Word of God that God shares with us. I think you're to clarify because I said he was talking to you feel prompted by the Spirit to do something that's got to be for you to do that. That's not the Word of God. Yeah. 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 So, so God gave us the Scriptures, meaning once we've had the Scriptures, we don't we're not going to like be the guy that says, "Oh, God gave you this this word to tell you." That's done. That the prophet thing is done basically since we have the scriptures. You would say. Yeah, because that's the difference between again. We got to be careful with that because we do go with each other and say, "What?" Okay, we do go to each other and say, 
the, the Lord speaking to me, right? Through the scriptures, he does that to us. That's what the Holy Spirit's work does in our lives. We, that's the whole process of sanctification. We grow and we learn. Uh, we're exhorted. We're disciplined. All these things are good, and we can share that with one another. But again, separating that from, I have the actual voice of God shared with me that I will give to you because that would have to be, we, we would need to add, I would, I would, if, some, if that were true, I would probably want to write that in the notes page of my Bible. <laughs> I'm going to put that in there. That's, that's heavy. <laughs> God is, uh, there's words there from actual Almighty God that we would elevate. Okay, peace. Hey, John, so in, in Revelation 22, 18, it says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plague described in the book, which is the completion of the canon. Yeah, yeah, and we're going to talk. That's 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 a great uh, segue because that's uh, that's will lead us into next week's talk on the canon. And uh, are those is that closed? Because there's many groups out there that says uh, no, it isn't closed. That uh, it's still open. Uh, the Mormons have another testament of Jesus Christ. That's the Book of Mormon. And uh, there's many out there that do that say it's not closed. I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, if, we, uh, if anyone has other comments or questions, we can talk about that after class. Good discussion. God speaks to us also through creation. Now, this is one that I love because I don't know if there's anybody out there that uh, just enjoys being out in nature who doesn't even mind coming out on a frigid cold morning because it's just beautiful. Uh, I, I see lots of hands going up. I love it. God speaks to us, not just his people. He speaks to all of his creation. Everyone, all people, through all time, through his creation. Psalms 19.1 says this, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaim his handiwork. Uh, Acts 14.7 says, Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. We're going to talk more about common grace in the future, that God gives his blessings to the saved to Christians and non-Christians, to believers and unbelievers. That His common grace, He gives good things to His creation, even to those who deny who He is. And that is what Acts 14, 17 is talking about. We all, everyone benefits from the rains and the blessings that God has given through His, uh, through his creation. But this brings us then to Romans chapter 1. And this is, these are hard, this, is, this is hard teaching. Uh, if you've studied Romans 1, 2, wrote the first two chapters of Romans, this is difficult teaching. And I think this is important enough that we need to read this together. Can somebody either read from the screen or read from your Bible? Romans 1, 18 through 21. Let's read this together. Uh, can somebody uh, read this aloud for me, either from your scripture or from the screen? I don't care. Any volunteers? Just read this aloud for us. <coughs> Go ahead. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world <clears throat> in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Okay, for God's invisible attributes, His power, His divine nature, are clearly perceived in His creation by what He's done. And so here comes the hard words. Ever since the creation of the world, since the beginning, and all these things that have been made, so here it is. So they, so we, are without excuse. There will be no one that stands before God someday and says, no one told me about Jesus. No one told me about the way. What this verse tells us is, is that, that God revealed himself to all of us very, very clearly through the power of his creation alone. That's hard teaching. But when we look around us and what we see in the macro and in the micro, those of us, we know these things because we are followers of God and his son. But yet the world looks at these things and they come up with other reasons. They look at all of the unimaginable complexity of nature and what creation is and find other reasons. And so yeah, I, put, I, I added some uh, slides to this. So here's the, I'll start with the macro. I enjoy astronomy. I've got a telescope, always have. I just, 
Make you look up in the night sky. It's just, it's just beautiful. It really is. And it's just amazing. So that's the Andromeda galaxy. That is two and a half million light years away from us. That is not, that is a group, a whole other galaxy of billions of stars. And we see it as a faint cloud. You can actually barely see this with the naked eye if it's very, very dark. Uh, but all the other stars you see around it are stars in our Milky Way galaxy. This is its own galaxy that's, that's full of its own billions and billions of stars. And there are, right now, at an infinite number of galaxies out there, too. This is just one of billions. And so when you think about the vastness of the macro, the space, we are j we're still beginning to figure out the complexity of, of the universe. So I put that up there. That's, uh, that's the Andromeda galaxy and the constellation Andromeda. Let's go to, uh, have, has anyone ever pulled over for a beautiful sunrise or a sunset and just pulled over? Just because, wow. Good morning. Good morning. Coming today? Okay. Okay, has anyone ever taken their phone out and taken a picture of it? <laughs> Some of you are nodding, yeah. Yeah, I took this picture. It's not, it doesn't look so good on the screen, but that was a beautiful sun. I don't know, I've got a lot of these. I can't tell that it looks like a sunset. But the fact is, just absolutely beautiful. God says, my, who I am, my power, my divine nature is right there. It's seen in nature. It's what God tells us. All right, let's go to the micro. On the wall of one of my science teacher's classrooms is this massive poster. It looks just like this. And it would probably fill up this big section of the wall right here. This is the biochemical pathways that happen within each of the 37 trillion cells within the human body. And so I go up and I, every time I go into her classroom, I stare at this thing because I have no concept of what any of this means. But you look at this and think that is the chemical, biochemical pathways. And then here's a small picture of just a tiny section of what that map is. Mapping out the biochemical pathways that happen in the 37 trillion cells that each of us carry in our bodies. Again, unimaginable complexity. And I'm going to end with the last picture of this. Yes, that's my grandson. But how about just the very creation of life and the, the absolute wonder and complexity of not just human life, but all life. I, uh, I was at a conference uh, in downtown Chicago about 10 years ago, and I was bored, so I left. And I walked over to the Field Museum and has anyone ever been there and seen their exhibit that walks you through the beginning of time to the dinosaurs, dinosaurs through modern times? Has anyone ever walked through it? It's really well done. It's beautiful. They, they, they've done a nice job with it. So you're walking through this, but it's interesting. You walk in, you start out at 4.5 billion years ago in history, and there's a the primordial soup, I think is what they call it. There's lava fields, and then that's it. And there's these tiny cell-like creatures swimming in the ooze. What always fascinates me is this. You walk in and start at 4.5 billion years, but I, as I walked through it, I couldn't help but think, what about that section before that? Where did all this come from? How did any of this even start? And, and, and the reality is science, there's no answer to that. We don't know. So science does not tell us that. They don't know. There are some theories out there, but no one knows where all of those things, how did anything it actually come to be? How was it had to start from something? Where did all that come from? And uh, there's, there's no answer to that. So it starts with a, with a process already in place. It doesn't share anything about how any of that started, how the materials, how the, uh, anything on the periodic table that got to be there in the first place. It's just assumed it was there, and this is how it started. But the real question is, we, we need one exhibit before that. How did all that get there, and then how was it started, and what went from dead, chem dead elements to life? How did that jump begin? And here's the, here's the terrible irony. If we look at, so for example, if you go back 2,000 years ago when, when, uh, when Paul was writing to the Roman church, and he wrote that through nature, that this was unknown. So over the last 2,000 years, science has shown us more and more and more of who our God is, right? And that unimaginable complexity. And we as his followers worship him more and more because of it. But yet, here's the terrible irony. All of our knowledge that we've learned more and more about nature and God has driven us farther away from God, not closer. 
And that's, uh, we, I think of the verses of our foolish, well, Paul wrote, our foolish hearts are dark, and in professing ourselves to be wise, we become fools. And so instead of honoring God with what they see, it drives and pushes that knowledge, pushes a darkened heart away. So God speaks to us through nature. God also speaks to us through a sense of good and evil. And I won't spend a lot of time on this one, but uh, uh, Romans 2.15 says, They show the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. The fact is, all of God's people that He's created are created in His own image. Yes, so they have, all of us, carry, whether we're followers of Christ or not, carry a sense of, of good and evil within our hearts. Yes? So even those who do not follow Christ have within them, they know the difference between right and wrong. We knew that, you knew that, I knew that before I was saved. Is that I had a sense, I knew it was good and evil. That is the human conscience. You can call it what you want. You can call it the good and evil sitting on each shoulder, whispering in your ear. Uh, Disney made it a little tiny cricket with an umbrella. But the point is that we know within us we have morals. And uh, that is one of the, when we get into how do we know what the scriptures say, whether God exists, how do we know God, that is one of the morals, is one of the reasons why we can use to say, because we all have that, is that we all have that sense of right and wrong. Even those you know, your family and friends, co-workers, who are not followers of Christ, they know the difference between it is inherently built into the hearts of each one of us. And the last one, how does God speak to us? This is what we're going to, this is our jump off point for next week. He speaks to us through the written word, the scriptures. And we have the Bible either in written form now on tablets and in multiple translations, but we have God's written word, the scriptures, which is our focus for study uh, now. Uh, Isaiah 38 says this, And now, go write it before them. God's saying this to Isaiah on a tablet. Inscribe it in a book. Remember the words that I gave you, God says, Write it in a book that it may be for the time to come as a witness forever. Isn't it amazing? We have that in our hands now. Jeremiah, God said to Jeremiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because this is what we'll study in depth for next week. But God uh, speaks to us through His, His written word. Now, let's talk about this a little bit. Grudem talks just briefly about this, about why does John refer to Jesus as the Word. I put that in quotes. So if you look at uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Why, the wor why use that word, Word, to describe Jesus? Just think about that for a second. What is that? We've all read this many, 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 many times. Why would John use that, that word to describe Jesus? He goes on, uh, John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh that word, and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John uses that again in Revelations 19. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which He is called is the Word of God. John's the only one that uses that. So why? What, uh, what does that mean? If you ever think about it, the Word. So the, the Greek word is logos, which we get, it literally means a word, a written word, but it also can mean study, and that's where we get the word logos, all the ologies, theology, biology, zoology, pick your ology, psychology, it means study of. Okay, so again, the question is, why would John use that? So think about your own answer to that before we continue. I want the answer or discuss out loud, but what have you always thought, or what comes to your mind when you read John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. It's always a capital because it's referring to Jesus in our American translations. But why is he described as a written word? And just think about that for just a second. Hundreds of years before Christ in Greek philosophy, there was a, there was a thought or a belief that the logos was what signified it was this word. It was, they, they used it beyond just saying it was a written word. And uh, it was the rational principle by which everything happens. It is the force, in some ways, when you read about this, it, it almost reminds you of like a Star Wars kind of a thing. There's this force that permeates all creation, everything, us. It is this 
ultimate principle, ultimate truth, ultimate reality. Uh, this was in Greek philosophy hundreds of years before Christ. At the time of Christ, the Stoics were the uh, leading Greek group of thinkers at the time, and they defined it as this logos, as this eternal reason. They defined it as this force that directed all things. It was the ultimate truth, ultimate purpose, ultimate reality, and it was completely impersonable. It does sound like the force from Star Wars, doesn't it? Completely impersonable. It had, uh, there was no personal feeling in it. It is impersonable, universal force, this truth that, uh, that, uh, that we should as humans aspire to know more and more about. And so when they use the word logos, that's what they're referring to, this ultimate reality and ultimate truth. I think that John's readers would have understood this when he called Jesus the logos, this ultimate truth, this ultimate reason. And that what was amazing to the, would be to the Stoics or the Greek philosophers at that time is that, and this person is in Jesus Christ. This word, this ultimate truth, this ultimate reality, the answer to everything, not only is he Jesus, but he was in the, in the, he became flesh and dwelt among us. I think John's readers would have understood that reference. I do. And uh, there's a, you can go ahead and do your own word study on Logos, and uh, you'll see that this comes up over and over again. And uh, I really think that that's what John was trying to say, that Jesus is the answer. He is what you've been looking for. That is Christ. And not only that, he became flesh, and he dwelt among us. And I think that when you look at that, it, it really makes sense what John was writing, that Jesus is that ultimate truth. He is that underlying, he's the universal principle and truth of everything, and he's personable. He became a human being. He became flesh. Um, any, any questions about that? Anything we've talked about so far? Let's do some of the questions then. We have some time this morning. The first question said, uh, do you think you'd pay more attention if God spoke to you from heaven or through the voice of a living prophet than if he spoke to you from the written words of Scripture? Let's take just about two minutes and discuss that at our tables. So let's just do this first part of the first question. Would we, would you or those around us, would we pay more ten attention if God spoke to us from heaven or through the voice of a living prophet than if we opened up the Bible and he spoke to us through the Scriptures? Let's talk about that for a second. like to say, like, oh yeah, we, we should, it should be one of the same. You would probably say, oh, well, in well, reality, we have to just set examples of them who had it first hand, and it didn't matter. If it was if they were the same boat, they didn't even know this. It's just like that. <laughs> okay, about 30 more seconds, and you wrap up your thought. <laughs> Okay, let's just bring this back together for a minute. Is there is there an obvious answer to this question? I think so. Some of you are saying so. Dave, what do you mean by that? Oh, I think it would be impossible not to pay more attention if God was speaking directly. If God spoke to us directly as He did throughout the the scripture, we see examples of this. All right, look at uh, Saul on his way to traveling, on his way to Tarsus. God spoke to him. God woke him up, yes? <laughs> I don't think it would be impossible or very difficult for him not to listen. Comment? Uh, we discussed that uh, even though, you know, like there's examples like Paul and all that, but there's also examples of like the apostles. They walked with Jesus, and he told them over and over again, I'm going to die, I'm going to be risen, and they had no idea why he was going to die. Um, we talked about uh, in 
Israelites. The Israelites, how they were literally shown, the pillars on the clouds, the, they were spoken to. Uh, they knew that Moses was spoken to directly from God, and they still disobeyed. Yeah. And even when, uh, in Jeremiah's case, when God literally told him that his wrath is coming and to warn the people, and they still didn't care at that point. Yeah. So there's the not so obvious answer, because I think both are right. Because if you look at examples, and it's amazing what and we think, why didn't they listen, right? What's wrong with those people? And yet I can't help but think, is it different for us today? We've got the Word of God spoken, especially with technology. It's, it's everywhere. Truth is everywhere. Churches in this country, especially here in the United States of America, uh, if, if you don't want to go to Village Bible Church within five-mile radius of here, you can go to three or more places. You'll get a good Bible teaching sermon in the morning. It doesn't, it, we're, we're not the only game in town that uh, is preaching the Word of God. So in this country, it is everywhere. We've got the truth here. And so I think of Luke chapter 16. There's, that's the parable Jesus told of the rich man who died and Lazarus. And remember, he cried out and says, Abraham, it's, let me go back to my family. I got five brothers. Let me go back and tell them. And the response was this. They've got the writing. They've got Moses and the prophets. Now, they were already dead. It means they have the scriptures. They've got it right there. It's telling them all this. This is not a surprise. So listen... If they don't listen to the scriptures, what's written, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. That's powerful. <laughs> the script, the truth is there. Meaning that this, your, fa your brothers, they're not going to listen anymore if you go back, rise from the dead, and tell them. They've got the truth right in front of them. I think that speaks to what you guys were talking about. Yes? I think you can even broaden that. So like every person in this room is a Christian has seen how God has worked in your life and ways he's directed you and taken care of you, yet we still don't obey sometimes. Even though we've, we've seen it firsthand, ways in our lives where we've been impacted and blessed and you know, given avenues to see God at work in our lives, we still have the same thought. Yeah. So I was really, we came and say that we haven't felt his presence, but we have the same vision. Right? So. Are we any different than God's people, the Jews that constantly rejected him over and over and over again after seeing his mighty works? I would, I'm going to say that I'm going to agree wholeheartedly that we are not. John, I was just thinking of when Lazarus was risen from the dead and they knew it was a dead man risen, what did, uh, what did they say? They, they wanted to seek to kill him, yeah. to kill Jesus. Because, yeah. And they saw someone rise from the dead. Yeah. yeah, I think sometimes it's easy to be an armchair Christian and look back and think of the failures that we see in the Old and New Testament I'm not so sure we're any different, as has as, as just been sta stated. So thank you. Good. Okay. Let's do, uh, let's do one more. Do you think that your present level of response to the written words of Scripture is an appropriate one? Let's not discuss this. Let's just each do a, just a quick 30-second reflection. Is my response to what I, we have just studied together and read, is my response to the written words of Scripture, is it an appropriate one? We can all... Do some self-reflection with that. I, I, I wrestled with this this week as I prepared as well, and I think you know, I know that I'm carrying the actual words of God in my hands when I open the Bible, and is my response appropriate to that? Is the reverence for it? Is my commitment to reading it and studying it? If I if that's what it is, the very words of God, is my response to that appropriate? And I think I have to answer that: No, it's not is that I wish that I would, I know these things, and I wish that would translate into my actions as far as my commitment to it and reading it and my time and study to it, that if that's what it really is, my response to it should be increased. So I'll let, we don't have to discuss that one. I think each one of us need to wrestle with it, and I think that's why, men, we are here to do this together in fellowship and community with one another, to challenge each other to respond to that because that's the purpose of this study, yes? To drive us back to the scripture and a greater knowledge of who our God is. Let's go to uh, this. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, I'll, I'll wrap up with this, and then uh, we want to do some a worship song. All scripture is breathed out by God. The Greek word there is actually the breath of God. Uh, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. And this is us. Why do we do this? So that us, the man of God, 
you and I may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is why we do this. And I think that's what we need to leave here today is the scriptures God has spoken to us. We have a record of that in our hands. That is the actual very breath of God to us. And I pray for myself, for all of us here, men, that that has the impact on us that it should. Okay, Josh? Uh, Pete's going to lead us in a, uh, in a worship song real quick, and then, uh, then I'll cover a couple of things. So, I mean, most of you, this, <clears throat> this is a blast from the past, but I think this song fits really well. It's a good chapter of talking about the Word of God, and it is a lamp to our feet. So, this is a, an old worship song, but uh, I'll try to pick the key to our questions. <laughs> Lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid and I think I've lost my way, Still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. My word is a lamp unto my feet and a light. And a light unto my path. All right, thank you, Pete. Um, just a quick uh, couple of things. We're going to pray here in a minute. We're going to pray around our tables, uh, um, and then I'll close us in a word after after a few minutes of prayer. A um, couple, uh, just a couple of things, real quick, though. Uh, one, uh, we're going to do some donations for uh, donuts. Donuts seem to be a big hit, especially with food. So, um, John bought 4,000 donuts and they're almost half gone. So, uh, whatever, if you want to give something, give something. If you don't, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know that you're allowed to. You could, you could be online. You your own donut. Uh, no, but. Uh, um, so there'll be a, there's a basket back there, throw a dollar in it, whatever. Um, there's a group tool going on. Um, stay in fellowship afterwards if you can. Uh, tables and chairs will stay up. Uh, I think there's still coffee in there. Last week we were out, out. Um, so, uh, there's still coffee, there's still going back there. Um, the, uh, those that are new, um, sign in in the back. That way I have your name and your email. Uh, we keep attendance each week of who's, who's here. Um, not to, uh, not to track you, but, uh, but simply to uh, make sure we're connected with each of you. Um, the last thing is, uh, I want to challenge everyone to, to, to memorize the scripture that Gruden gives each week, uh, or for each chapter. So next week is, is Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. So I, I want that to be a challenge for us. It's not something, it's something that we challenge our children to do in Awana, but uh, for some reason we as adults think we're above that. And, uh, and I'm just as bad as everyone else. So uh, I'm, I'm terrible at scripture memory. Uh, but, hey Josh, yeah. I did the one for this week. You did? I handed it to my son and said, I have to recite this verse to you. You should have seen his eyes light up. <laughs> you know, just the idea that oh, my dad struggles with Memorization too. It was yeah, just, it was yeah. Just well, I was going to read it. Why don't you go ahead and recite it for us? <laughs> All right. Um. <laughs> I get two helps. I get two helps. Okay. Okay. He does have a yes. square around it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. We did point. not plan that out at all. Uh, I literally just put him on the spot. So yeah. if you don't mind, you know it. Psalm 1 1 through 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the uh, path, in the, in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands 
in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of scoffers, but he delights, uh, but he delights in the law of the Lord uh, on his life and meditates day and night. Well, I'll sign that for you. Yeah. <laughs> for being put on the spot, that's awesome. And you want to be the way to put up. Huh? What's that? You want to be the way to put up. Yeah. 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 So I'm not going to call on people each week, so don't think I'm going to call on you. This is a challenge for each of us uh, to do each week. And, uh, and what I want this to do, um, as I was thinking about this, about that this week, is I want that to um, really focus our prayer time around our table. Um, you can, if you have a prayer request, uh, something that's really pressing in your life, um, share that. Share that around your table uh, so that we can pray, pray with each other. But secondly, uh, prayer is, is part of our worship to God. Like, that's why we're doing the study. That's why we're uh, learning uh, theology and what God's word means today um, and what it is. And so I, I want that to focus our prayer time as well. So take five minutes uh, or so, uh, or as long as you need. Um, we'll be here. Stay as long as you want. Uh, you can stay until tomorrow morning. That's fine, too. I'll leave the alarm on for you. Um, or off. Uh, and uh, yeah, just let that lead your prayer time. Pray around your tables. Pray uh, whoever's comfortable uh, praying. Go ahead. So, go ahead, guys. And then I'll, I'll close with a prayer after.